Hello, everyone, and welcome to week two of uh, contemporary documentary media. The topic of this week is embodied histories, performance, and reenactment. Um, I asked you to watch uh, this week Joshua Oppenheimer's 2012 film, The Act of Killing, and I recommended, if you had time, Errol Morris's uh, seminal film from 1988, The Thin Blue Line. And uh, I had three read readings I requested you to read, which was uh, Errol Morris's article in the New York Times, Played Again, Sam, Reenactments Part 1, just the first part of his two-part uh, set of articles, uh, Bill Nichols's Documentary Reenactment and the Phantasmatic Subject, uh, which I will take up a fair bit in this first half of the lecture, and second, or excuse me, thirdly, Janet Walker's article on the act of killing, referred pain, the act of killing, and the production of a crime scene, which you'll note um, I also provided as an option for you to uh, write on for your reading response, uh, if you're interested. So this lecture has basically roughly two parts, and there's, so there's two different videos. The first video uh, the first slideshow pertains to a uh, discussion of reenactment, and then we move to a discussion of the thin blue line. And then in the second slideshow, um, we go into the act of killing, and I will outline some questions and discussion points. So as I said, this first uh, slideshow uh, takes up the broad question of reenactment, which is uh, perhaps one of the most popular um, forms or modes currently deployed in the documentary and it's very interesting because for a long time i think as i even suggested last week the reenactment was considered a faux pas um, in documentary production and so uh, you know with the rise of uh, cinema verite or direct cinema or observational filmmaking more broadly in the 1960s Reenactment certainly um, seemed to almost disappear from the documentary scene, only to really kind of really strongly reemerge uh, in the late 1980s with films like The Thin Blue Line. So this is the kind of moment that Bill Nichols, in his article, Documentary Reenactment and the Phantasmatic Subject, um, is responding to the sort of history of reenactment and then this kind of return to it in what we might see as the postmodern moment of documentary emerging in the 1980s, and then we could call it uh, the contemporary documentary as well. So Nichols uh, provides a number of uh, important insights into the concept of reenactment, uh, which he relates to the notion uh, of the phantasmatic. And I will turn to the phantasmatic uh, momentarily, but what I want to point out uh, that's a uh, so far very significant to Nichols's conception of documentary reenactment is uh, firstly, among other things, um, its strange status, status uh, in the documentary relates in part to what he calls its iterability. Now, iterability, which we see here in my second quote here from page 80, um, pertains to what we could say is the ability of something to be repeated. Uh, to be iterable is to exist as a thing that is necessarily repeated. Uh, this thing is part of a series of repetitions whose very identity, whose very meaning, in fact, depends on its uh, ability uh, and its condition of repetition. So it is a thing that exists, in a sense, as uh, a repetition in relationship to uh, something before it, and in some other sense implied something um, to come uh, after it. Now, in this third uh, box of text I have here, um, Nichols says that in reenactment, uh, the indexical bond, right, the, 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 the relationship between the camera or the film strip uh, or the image, we could say more broadly, and the object that it captures, that was captured on film, that was in front of the camera, the thing itself, the thing, the it, that is recorded, this indexical bond between the image and this it, this real-world object, which he says can guarantee evidentiary status, but not the meaning or interpretation uh, of images taken as evidence, no longer joins the reenactment to that for which it stands. He says, instead, this indexical bond joins the image to the production of the reenactment 
the reenactment is evidence of an iterative gesture, but not evidence of that for which the reenactment stands. It is, in fact, not historical evidence, but an artistic interpretation, always offered from a distinct perspective and carrying embedded within it further evidence of what he calls the voice of the filmmaker. Now, this notion of the voice of the filmmaker uh, is a concept that Nichols developed all the way back in the early 1980s uh, in an article in Film Quarterly in spring 1983. And in that article, uh, he described the documentary voice as, as a voice that speaks through the body of the film. That is to say, through editing, through subtle and strange juxtapositions, through music, through lighting, composition, and mise-en-scene, through dialogue overheard and commentary delivered, through silence as well as speech, and through sounds and images as well as words. This dispersed and polymorphous voice possesses an intrinsically, what he calls, desubjectivized form. Uh, the workings of a phantasmatic arise through it. So an intrinsically desubjectivized form is to say, um, you won't necessarily see the filmmaker in the film uh, for the film to nevertheless have a voice. You may not even hear the voice of the filmmaker, right? Speaking in voiceover or off camera or interacting with subjects in the film. But nevertheless, what Nichols calls the voice of the filmmaker is present in all of these other uh, aesthetic and formal choices that are made. Now, Errol Morris in Play It Again, Sam, Reenactments Part One, um, also uh, makes an interesting case for the importance, the key importance of reenactment to the documentary. And he says, referring to the dominance of uh, observational cinema verite in America in the 1960s and 1970s, that critics argue that the use of reenactments suggests a callous disregard on the part of a filmmaker for what is true. I don't agree. Some reenactments serve the truth, others subvert it. There is no mode of expression, no technique of production that will instantly produce truth or falsehood. There is no veritas lens, no lens that provides a truthful picture of events. There is cinema verite and kino pravda, but no cinematic truth. And of course, for, uh, Morris is referring here when he says kino pravda to Ziga Vertov, the great Soviet filmmaker of the 1920s and 1930s, his notion of Kino Pravda, which is to say film truth, this truth of the world in its relationship to the cinema, sort of world and cinema co-creating one another is, is Kino Pravda, film truth, the revelation of the world that only cinema itself can uh, reveal. And then of course with Cinema Verite, um, which is another the French expression of film truth that we can credit to Jean Rouch and Edgar Morin, and which they developed in their 1961 Cinema Verite film, Chronicle of a Summer, was also about this notion of uh, film itself as catalyzing real world truths so that cinema and uh, the world it documents are actually um, mutually uh, determining one another and responding to one another. This isn't just a passive camera. Um, I think it's important to bring in the dialogue to Morris's point about uh, uh, reenactments that Nichols says uh, reenactments are clearly a view rather than the view from which the past yields up its truth. A view rather than the view. Right? So again, this situated, embodied, uh, subjective, but maybe uh, desubjectivized through the voice of the film, right? The voice of the documentary, the voice. Uh, that Nichols identified, but nevertheless, it is a view rather than the view. But this is not to say it doesn't produce truth in some shape or form. So this takes us to this concept of the phantasmatic as Nichols identifies it. Now, Nichols draws on a range of theorists to explore and develop what he calls the phantasmatic, which is a concept uh, that he takes from psychoanalytic thought of the 20th century. In particular, he cites people like Jean Laplanche and J.B. Pontalis, who describe, uh, you know, the, the child, um, the, the, the sort of psychoanalytic notion of the child going through the motions of, um, um, you know, in his example, the child uh, reaching for the mother's breast for milk and how this fulfills a need Right when the child actually acquire, you know, acquires the milk, but this gesture itself of reaching for the breast becomes itself um, a significant act independent of 
obtaining the, uh, the milk, which is the object of need. And so it becomes, through this series of later repetitions, the series, just the gesture of reaching for the breast in this psychoanalytic example from Laplanche and Pontalis that Nichols draws on, this, this very act, this very gesture of reaching itself produces significations and speaks to more desire uh, rather than need, right? Um, and so uh, Nichols relates this, um, among other things, to the theorist, uh, the American theorist Gregory Bateson and his notion of play, uh, which uh, Nichols uh, explores further on page 73, uh, if you'd like to get into more detail about that. But we could say very quickly that what one thing that play does in ba Bateson's understanding is that uh, rather than uh, executing an action, right, say, uh, you play fighting, you, you go through the motions of fighting, uh, punching, kicking, biting, what have you, but they no longer produce the effect of hurting the other subject, but then so they, 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 they become signifiers in this semiotic language, they become signifiers of pain or of the potential to hurt, but they in themselves do not hurt. So again, there's this kind of uh, separation, but also resignification that occurs inside of the phantasmatic. Um, one other key, just important thing to emphasize uh, with this notion of the phantasmatic in terms of the re in terms of reenactment is that this engagement with what he calls the signifier itself generates pleasure that is both corporeal, which is to say bodily, this notion of going through the motions, but it is also psychic, which is to say mental, emotional, and cognitive all of those things, okay? Um, so these things play themselves out in complex ways in the sort of haunted, phantasmatic logic of documentary reenactment, which we'll further explore now. So Nichols identifies, broadly speaking, five modes of reenactment, what he calls realist dramatization, typifications, Brechtian distanciation, stylization, and parody and irony. Now, I will provide an overview of four of these five categories, skipping over stylization in order to discuss it in more depth in our look at the Thin Blue Line and Errol Morris's use of it, uh, of reenactment in that film. So, reenactment, realist dramatization. As I noted last week, um, some of the very earliest films identified as documentaries um, deployed uh, reenactment. Um, as Nichols notes in his essay, the mode of reenactment we are perhaps most likely familiar with as contemporary viewers is realist dramatization. We see this form of reenactment in many popular television shows and documentaries, particularly those dealing in true crime or historical reconstruction. Um, but this form extends, as I said, back to the origins of documentary, such as Edward Curtis's uh, 1914 ethnographic film In the Land of the War Canoes and Robert Flaherty's 1922 The Nook of the North. Now both of these films, uh, War Canoes and The Nook of the North, can be lumped together under what we might call salvage anthropology, um, which devoted itself to preserving or recovering um, what it, the uh, ethnographer, ethnographer believed or documentarian believed to be a uh, disappearing culture, a way of life as uh, modernity came upon it. Now we will explore this type of problem further in our week on ethnographic filmmaking uh, in the third part of this course. But what is further important to note here very quickly is that these realist dramatizations um, um, often observe the conventions of fictional narrative, which is to say, among other things, that they are realistic, they provide a realistic or convincing setting, what is also called verisimilitude. They include, uh, they're constructed to develop identification with characters, whether these characters are um, you know, singularized and given individuality, or we identify with them um, as objects or types to anticipate uh, the next, uh, the next uh, mode of reenactment. They also involve, in terms of these conventions of narrative, these realist dramatizations, they involve emotional involvement, effective actions, authentic locales, as I said, the codes of fiction, which is to say, there is a world that appears real, this is a coherent world. 
Now, while dealing with a mythically constructed individual, for example, in Nanook of the North, right, because Nanook, the figure of Nanook is not the character's real name, and we see this seal hunt as the example of reenactment, which is itself a construct, in Flaherty's demonstration of what he presents to be a typical day in the life of the Inuit, uh, the film also partakes of the second category of reenactment, what Nickel identifies as typification, which I will turn to in just a moment. Now, Nichols doesn't say much about this other notion uh, of reenactment, this other possibility of reenactment, but we could also here, I think, usefully dis discuss for a moment um, the concept and practice of pre-enactment in the documentary, right? The anticipation of a future event, the construction of a scenario that gives us a feeling for, uh, you know, uh, a event to come, right? Something of the future, but that seems imminent. This could be the immediate future or or the distant future but that emerges from in some way from the present uh, which is to say the past um, now uh, one of the examples that uh, nickel cites as an example of pre-enactment in his essay is of course peter watkins's 1965 film war game which for our purposes here we can understand to be the realistic portrayal of the what if of nuclear annihilation with combined with expository voiceover narration uh, and verite or observational style cinematography, which is to say you know, the camera's handheld, uh, providing of a feeling of immediacy and urgency. Here is a brief clip. This could be the way the last two minutes of peace in Britain would look. Nine sixteen a.m. A single megaton nuclear missile overshoots Manston Airfield in Kent and airbursts six miles from this position. At this distance, the heat wave is sufficient to cause melting of the upturned eyeball, third degree burning of the skin, and ignition of furniture. <laughs> Twelve seconds later, the shock front arrives. The uh, second form of uh, documentary reenactment that Nichols outlines is, of course, typification. Uh, which goes right back again to the origins of the documentary. As Nichols writes, John Grierson uh, adopted this technique wholesale for the British documentary movement of the 1930s. Reenactments as typifications proliferated. Coalface, uh, directed by Alberto Calvin-Conti in 1933, has several sequences of coal miners mining or taking uh, their lunch break that possess a similar aura of present-day reality simply observed when they are, in fact, staged. Now, Nichols draws on the um, film theorist Vivian Sobchak uh, in order to discuss this concept of what he calls typical particulars. And Vivian Sobchak writes, quote, unless something happens to specifically particularize these existential entities as in some way singular, they will be engaged as what philosophers call typical particulars, a form of generalization in which a single entity is taken as exemplary of an entire class. So typification is part of the uh, social effectivity presumed and activated by the classical documentary of the Grissonian model. It presumes and thus uh, and also contribute, contributes to a coherent social space of readily identifiable classes, of groups that people uh, clearly uh, by appearance belong to, both the those uh, before the camera in the film as well as the viewers who are said to be viewing it and understanding uh, these social types. The next uh, form of reenactment that Nichols discusses is Brecht, what he calls Brechtian distanciation. Now this notion of Brechtian distanciation, very quickly for those of you who may not uh, be familiar with um, the theater, it's named after the great uh, German uh, playwright and theorist 
of the first part of the 20th century, uh, Bertolt Brecht. Now Brecht, uh, or Brecht um, developed this concept of what he called uh, the V effect, or uh, Werfenstrom, I believe, uh, the alienation effect, distanciation, which was supposed to, in some way, uh, not simply produce a, a realistic portrait that would absorb viewers into the story and spectacle of the fiction, but would yield a more uh, educational uh, form of viewing that would uh, hold the viewers in some ways at some kind of distance from the spectacle, from the narrative, from the fiction, in order to understand both the workings of the fiction itself and the historical, social, uh, context in which that fiction is uh, activated and taking shape. Inside of this, Brecht developed this concept of what he called the social jest, jest, G-E-S-T. Now the social jest uh, effectively is, is a kind of action or gesture that in some way indicates a social historical meaning. So it's contingent, right? And he uses this example of swatting a fly, right? Um, in Brecht's understanding, at least, when a person swats at a fly, it is not a social jest. But if they swat at the fly in such a way that it indicates that they, uh, you know, that the fly is drawn to them and they um, don't want to look like a poor person who is dirty in front of uh, wealthy people, you know, um, walking in front of them, or their peers, say, walking in front of them, then it becomes, as it were, uh, through this performance, uh, in a way, a social jest that points out the social and historical significance of this activity, in this case of swatting a fly. Um, in all of these ways, then, the Brechtian form of Brechtian distanciation embraces, in a way, artifice or embraces display. The performance or reenactment effectively says to the audience, this is a performance this is a construct. But nevertheless, uh, Nichols qualifies or adds to this that nevertheless, this is precisely how history is accessed through this self-aware um, uh, display of artifice and constructiveness. The broader historical dimensions of uh, what is being depicted are revealed rather than let's say in a realist dramatization in which the, the, the sort of the, in a way, the conventions of fiction seem to uh, predominate, right? And so this is, you know, it's a very interesting and tricky set of problems. And one of the examples that uh, Nichols looks at is a very interesting film that we might see a clip of in our week on Werner Herzog is of course his documentary film from 1998, Little Dieter Needs to Fly, in which the, um, German-American pilot Dieter Dangler was shot down um, during the Vietnam War, taken as a prisoner at first in Laos and then in Vietnam by the Viet Cong. And it's, it's a film that uh, he was a uh, prisoner for, I believe, about a period of about six months. And in Werner Herzog's film, they returned to some of these villages um, and Dieter Dangler sort of recreates uh, in a sort of Brechtian way, some of these scenarios that he endured, the hardships uh, that he endured um, before he escaped from uh, the prison camp in the 1960s. Finally, skipping over stylization, we arrive at parody and irony, the fifth mode of reenactment that Nichols discusses. Now, irony is a noun uh, that, uh, among other things, is involved in the expression of a meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically for humorous or emphatic effect. So irony speaks to, in a way, a state of affairs or an event that seems, in a way, deliberately or perhaps not deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing uh, or um, in some way engaging or striking as a result of this. So, you know, irony, broadly speaking, pertains to when it's one thing that seems, you know, something is intended, and then the almost the opposite effect is what is actually produced, right? And in this um, sense, uh, Nichols devotes a number of uh, very interesting paragraphs to a discussion of the 2003 film um, capturing the Freedmans, directed by Andrew Jarecki. Now, um, he goes quite a, a, 
complex reading of the film, but for our purposes, I want to seize on um, a quote from Nichols in which he says that the video, this film, um, among other things, is about a family in uh, on Long Island, New York, uh, who shot a lot of home movies, first like 8mm home movies, and then later they used video cameras. So there's also this relationship between um, you know, 8mm, the graininess, the sense of nostalgia, uh, the sense of the pastness attached to the 8mm films, and then the video footage that was shot you know, uh, 10, 15 years later. And if what this documentary brought uh, very quickly is about, is about this family that they discover that the father, in fact, uh, has a sort of, uh, was a, uh, was a, was a convict, became a convicted of pedophilia and some sex crimes against children. And the, um, one of his sons is also becomes accused and also convicted of these uh, sex crimes and, and pedophilia. And the filmmaker, Andrew Jarecki, constructs his film and in investigating the case and the consequences for the family through the use, among other things, of these uh, home movies and home videos. And so Bill Nichols says, uh, quote, that the video footage... Uh, represents the Friedman son's attempt to reenact their own past. They are clearly aware of the attempt is a reenactment rather than a genuine return to a lost object and irretrievable moment, right? This moment uh, of innocence before they were accused and then convicted of these crimes. The video footage stands as a sign that describes both the lost object, the unqualified pleasure of physical cavorting that was once theirs, and its absence, the effort that must now be made to reenact what was once spontaneous exuberance. And so Nichols calls this, um, you know, uh, going through the motions, right? And we see in these, uh, in the clips I will show you that, you know, first we'll look at how the film situates the uh, eight millimeter footage as the sort of spontaneous expression of joy. And then we'll look at a clip of the video footage that shows them trying to recreate that, to reenact that, but this uh, insurmountable phantasmatic gap seems to be uh, ever-present in the video footage. So first we will take a look at the form of spontaneous family togetherness, as Nichols puts it, that has become the lost object captured in old 8mm home movies. And there are, of course, uh, Spanish subtitles uh, on my clicker. Arnold liked pictures. I mean, that's, let's face it, he liked pictures. Well, we're here. This is it. The whole family assembled. Everybody! In Great Neck, New York. We had three sons. David, being the oldest, had a lot of responsibility when he was young. Seth was an outright rebel. And somehow Jesse was just like the, the one that, that keeps trying to catch up and doesn't quite make it. So it was the father, um, Arnold Friedman, and then the youngest son, uh, Jesse Friedman, who were both accused and then convicted of um, various uh, pedophilia crimes in their hometown of uh, Great Neck, New York. Now the um, here is the, um, the the video diary. So we had the eight millimeter, and now here is the video diary of uh, the uh, Friedman family, shot I believe you know a, a day before I think the father um, was to be uh, uh, sent to prison, uh, where he in fact died not too many years later. And Nichols says very quickly that in the video diaries, the sons and father do once again now what they once did then in the older home movies and derive from this act not the original satisfaction of a need, but the gratification of a desire that stems from the sequence of images or signifiers they fabricate for themselves. Jive for mom, burrito, food, pizza, we're doing 
think we could see another kind of relationship of parody and irony in reenactment, or, or what I'm going to say here is pre-enactment, in a very recently released film um, on Netflix entitled um, Dick Johnson is Dead, which was directed uh, by his daughter, the documentary cinematographer and filmmaker Kirsten Johnson, released in 2020. And so um, Nichols says that other reenactments, or am I, I'm arguing here, pre-enactments, adopt what he calls a parodic tone that may call the convention of the reenactment itself into question or treat a past or future inevitable contingent and or possible occurrence in a comic light. So in the case of Dick Johnson is Dead, the filmmaker works with her father um, and then a number of doubles to stage a series of death scenes, different various ways that Dick Johnson uh, could conceivably die. He has been diagnosed with a fatal disease, and so in order to kind of come to terms with this, to come to terms with his imminent death, uh, both uh, the filmmaker, his daughter, and him himself stage these various, we could argue, parodic, uh, self-aware um death scenes to um, find a way to make death, his death, um, not only to make light of it, but to make it intelligible and something shareable. And uh, the film is regarded by many critics as very successful uh, in that attempt to tackle a very heavy subject matter with a kind of rather light touch in a sense.